and it is my great, great pleasure to introduce you to Kelly McDaniel. Kelly McDaniel, LPC, NCC, CSAT. She's a licensed professional counselor and author, and she specializes in treating women who struggle with relationships. As the first clinician to name an attachment injury as mother hunger, Kelly explores the legacy of maternal deprivation. Her first book, Ready to Heal, addresses cultural double standards and family wounds that set women up for addictive relationship habits. Her upcoming book, Mother Hunger, speaks to the millions of women who suffer with a lifelong emotional burden that adversely affects self-worth. It didn't have a name until now. And I've been following Kelly for a year on Instagram, and I've just, I'm always so, so amazed at her posts and the content. And I just, you know, in my 30 some years in recovery of my personal recovery, and in particular, the last 10 years since we've been doing or hosting or whatever we call this She Recovers thing, um, the number of women who identify as having issues with their mom or attachment issues, childhood trauma, emotional neglect related to their moms has really, really always risen to the top um, as a topic for, for discussion about explanations for why we are the way we are. So I'm just really delighted. I know that there are a great, great many women in our community who need to hear this, uh, who need to understand this issue so that they can continue to or begin to heal. So Kelly, delighted to have you. I'm going to uh, turn it over to you and you can share your screen whenever you're ready. I'm going to just turn off my video. I'm here. Nobody's going to abandon you, but uh, we will just be in the background. Welcome and thank you. Thank you so much for having me here, Dawn, and for that gracious, lovely welcome. And I'm just so impressed with your mission for the community of women that you serve and for your energy to continue to show up and do this service work all the time. Yes. I will go ahead and share the screen now um, because I've put some graphics together that I think will help us um, have a visual as well as my audio explanation of Mother Hunger. These are two book covers. I'm really excited. The one in purple is for um, the US. And I just learned last week that apparently the UK does their own book cover. And so that's the one in red and gray. Um, apparently this topic is getting a lot more attention across the ocean than it is even here in, in the States. So I'm excited to know this um, and it's new information. So I'm happy to share it with you today. So Mother Hunger, it's, it's really about talking about the legacy of maternal deprivation. And I'm going to be talking about why this is not an invitation to blame mothers. This is a much larger issue. Mothers are not nurtured. Mothers aren't protected and supported and guided in ways that are helpful to themselves or to children. And so um, I'm certainly not looking for a way to blame mothers. I'm looking for a framework that really started um, in my first book, Ready to Heal. Um, it was published for the first time in 2008. It was republished in 2012. In 2008, there was just a brief mention of the word mother hunger in a, like a paragraph. And I think I was nervous to even mention it, um, but it got so much attention from the women that were reading my book that um, when I redid the book in 2012, I did a whole chapter on mother hunger. And that's my favorite chapter in Ready to Heal. It's chapter seven. Um, what I was noticing with the women that were coming to work with me to treat love addiction um, and sexual compulsivity was kind of this, this yearning for a quality of love that seemed unattainable. Um, and when I would try to figure it out, I, I did turn to the book, somehow this book found me called Motherless Daughters. It was written by Hope Edelman. She's a journalist, not a therapist. And yet it was probably one of the most sophisticated descriptions of what it's like to be an adult woman, but still feel like a child, to have some arrested development, to have transferred the, the need for a mother onto other things or people, um, to have substituted things for mothering that obviously don't work very well, whether that's um, food or fantasy. She was giving language to something I was seeing, but she was writing for daughters who had lost their mother, daughters whose mothers had died young. And I was fascinated why my clients who had living mothers look so much like her case studies. Um, and then I found the work of Pauline Boss. Dr. Pauline Boss wrote the book, Ambiguous Loss. And she talks about 
Well, she was specifically talking about what it's like to be a caregiver for somebody with a degenerative brain um, problem, such as Alzheimer's, and how the person who's physically there is emotionally not there, and what that does to the caregiver. So I started thinking about ant- ambiguous loss in terms of the women I was seeing who had a physical present mother, but the mother didn't behave in a way that was maternal. So this could explain why they were having symptoms like motherless daughters. So I started working with this to get an idea. So just a little background for Mm -hmm. those of you that like um, attachment theory, securely attached adults don't have mother hunger. And the science tells us that's about 50% of the population. I think that's really generous, but whatever, that's what the science says. So securely attached adults don't resonate with this term. Anxiously attached, adults. Well, okay. So the spectrum of attachment puts the other 50% of us on somewhere in the insecure attachment that could either be avoidant, that could be anxious, that could be disorganized. Anxious adults tend to resonate with this term right away. Anxious attachment people, we know that we're yearning for something and an avoidantly attached person does not really resonate with this term right away because, um, avoidant attachment generally means I'm needless, I'm wantless. And so identifying a need it just doesn't happen easily and adults with disorganized attachment actually have third degree mother hunger which is a whole different category that I'll talk about later in the presentation so in this book which I love Eleanor Oliphant is the um, main character it's written by Gail Honeyman and I bring this up some of you might have read it if you haven't read it I couldn't encourage it enough but she says loneliness is the new cancer This is the essential piece of mother hunger. And if there's any silver lining to what we've all been living through in the last year with this global pandemic, it would be that maybe loneliness is no longer a topic that we're embarrassed to talk about. I think shame is so core to the loneliness that a lot of times we don't want to mention it. We don't want to talk about it. And if we do talk about it, hopefully we're really careful who we talk to because people tend to think that this is just a woman's problem, being lonely. It's something wrong inside us. Um, And I think now we know this is a universal problem and it's not always about mother hunger. So the right name is so important. And this is why um, I'm excited to see the receptive response to the term mother hunger. What I hear from women all the time when they realize, oh, They hear the word and this kind of thud comes of recognition where the body knows instantly there's the name. The body wants the name, the brain wants the name because once there's the right name, healing just kind of starts to fall into place. We're designed to heal, but things, healing can get stunted, frozen is really what I call it, um, when there's not a right name and then the body doesn't really know what direction to go in to heal. Um, this is a question that I get a lot about, you know, why do I call it mother hunger? I call it mother hunger because I think we need to really have a paradigm shift around the primacy and importance of mothering, not to blame women, not to blame mothers, but because how important mothering is seems to get diminished as we diminish women. Um, And when we diminish women, we diminish children. And I think as long as we're not really looking at the nature of this injury, it lets us kind of um, not prioritize what's happening. There is such a thing as father hunger. That's just not what I'm talking about, but it's a very real thing. Um, Our mother though is our first love, regardless of whether that's a positive feeling or not. And from our mother's um, touch, smell, sound, presence or absence, we learn how love feels. And that's why I'm talking about mother hunger. Yes, men have mother hunger too, but I work with women. I write for women. I talk for women. I teach for women. Um, I think the issue for men and mother hunger is a really tender, true issue. And I hope someday to identify a man who can talk about that and speak men's language. As I've said many times, and I'll continue to say, this is not about blaming mothers, because let's think about what kind of world makes it difficult for a mother to nurture, protect her little ones. 
And I'm just going to very briefly say a few things about patriarchy, not much because that's a whole nother topic, but what we have as women is a sexual alarm system. And this is built into us very, very young when as little girls, most of us know what it feels like to be um, somehow unsafe. And it's somehow related to the fact that we have a cute little body. Um, you hear comments all the time that people say to um, parents who have little girls. And if the little girl happens to also be a beautiful, um, people will say, oh, you're going to be in trouble with that one. Little ones, we hear this as, as um, little girls, and we know that we're in danger. And so in this book, Judith Levitt talks a lot about how the sexual alarm system keeps us as women somewhat in overdrive, hypervigilant, knowing that if we're out alone um, in a city or after dark, we are basically sexual prey. And in a world where we're sexual prey, we know fear. And this fear that we become adapted to um, translates through the generations. So if you think about how our body adapts to fear, and then we can pass that to our unborn children, and then the fear that our grandmothers were carrying, our mothers were carrying, it's transmitted into us. And then think about adding on to that the fear of living in a world where all of your ancestors were slaves or your ancestors were lynched, hung, raped, killed, um, and just keep adding, keep adding the epigenetic legacy that would make it really difficult to become a mother who is calm, peaceful, responsive, adequately safe and nurtured enough to provide nurturing for her little one. And it, it really helps form a context of where and how mother hunger can be so widespread. Here's another reason I think that I call it mother hunger because I really wanna focus on the importance of mothering. So if you think for a minute, how would you define what makes a good mother? Or what makes good mothering? Because really love is a verb, loving, right? So how would you define it? And this is the question that's been keeping me up at night for, for years while I try to operationalize the definition enough to offer good treatment for women coming to seek relief. And here's what I found that's in the Cambridge Dictionary. Look at this definition. Cambridge Dictionary defines mothering as the process of caring for children as their mother or caring for people in the way a mother does. And then Marian Webster defines it as to bring forth from the womb, to give birth to. These definitions tell us nothing. And they imply somehow that mothering is simple and innate to having a female body. So in the book, Mother Hunger, I write this. Ideal candidates for motherhood must be self-starter, able to comfort and bond with a new vulnerable human by holding, feeding, responding to nonverbal cues. Responsibilities include protecting this human from external threats and actively engaging in their academic, spiritual, social development. Candidates need equal parts tenderness, strength, grace under pressure, and healthy boundaries. And there is no pay for this position. Sounds pretty impossible. So to define mothering, I've divided it into three categories. What, what actually are mothers doing? They're doing three things. They're nurturing, they're protecting, and ultimately then later, they're guiding their little ones. And I'm gonna sp sp specifically think about daughters because as daughters, we're gonna continue to look to our mother for guidance. And this is where it might shift um, for, for boys that they will eventually maybe look away from mother for guidance. But um, originally we all need her for nurturing. Nurturing begins in utero. The actual word nurture comes from nutrir, which is a Latin word that means to suckle. And perhaps this is another reason why women are so uniquely designed for bonding and nurturing. In fact, women have three more oxytocin receptors than men. Oxytocin is what bonds us to one another. Oxytocin is released during lactation, during childbirth, and during orgasm. And so women have three opportunities to feel the rush of this bonding hormone. 
nurturing, you know, when babies are born, they can't tell the difference between night and day. So the fact that we put babies alone to sleep is a threat to bonding and it's a threat to attachment and it is a breeding ground for mother hunger to grow. Um, so in the book, I talk a lot about nighttime issues. 90% of a child's brain has formed in the first five years, which does include pregnancy. So I love this picture um, because it's a good reminder that mother hunger is simply a name and a framework to identify developmental needs that were lost so that we can reclaim them as adults. It's hard to go heal something when we don't know what it is we're healing, first of all, so we need the name. And second of all, we need to know which piece was missing. Was it the nurturing that was missing? Was it the protection that was missing? Or did we have those things, but we missed some guidance? Maybe our mother either died before we were teenagers or she never developed herself so that we had to look elsewhere for guidance. But plenty of people can nurture and protect children if they want to. And um, that's why I love this picture. Mother hunger is more about the developmental needs than it is about always who provided them. Nurturing is the quality of responsive care between infant and mother that involves touching, holding, feeding, soothing, grooming, and responding. And it is the language of love that the infant brain learns. I don't know if you know this, but John Watson was a um, psychiatrist in the 1920s, and he was really kind of the first um, pop psychologist and um, studied behaviorism. He, he didn't really like Freud, so instead of looking at the unconscious, he started looking at Pavlov, who was training dogs. And he felt we could train children just as Pavlov trained dogs. Um, unfortunately, behaviorism is still alive and well in some parenting uh, philosophy, but his ideas and his advice were this to parents and many parents followed these guidelines. Never hug and kiss your children. Never let them sit in your lap. If you must, kiss them once on the forehead when they say goodnight. Shake hands with them in the morning. Give them a pat on the head. And if they make an extraordinary good job of a difficult task. I mean, can you imagine like, this is why I think we love watching little mammals like dogs and kittens and horses and cows and love their little ones because it's so beautiful and it's so natural. There's a lot of touch. There's a lot of cuddling, a lot of suckling, a lot of touch. That's what we all need as humans. And if I had time, I'd be showing you videos of what happens when we don't have that or when mammals don't have that. Let's talk about protection. So we've talked about nurturing, which is the first element of maternal care. The second one is protection. Um, protection is um, essential for the survival of our species. Symbolically and literally, maternal love represents protection, standing between a child and life's hardships. And I think we come into the world as infants totally dependent on maternal protection. And this is where I'd like to differentiate between a frightening or a frightened caregiver. So, We've talked about the sexual alarm system. We've talked about uh, the fact that women grow up frightened um, in, in many, many places in the world. There are plenty of frightened women who can be very nurturing mothers. Um, however, our own anxiety, our own fear, our own kind of stress level can convey to our little ones totally um, unconsciously that, that we're not safe and they're not either. So that's what I'm talking about in the protection section. That's different than a caregiver who's actually scaring her child, a caregiver who is yelling and um, physically threatening. That's third degree mother hunger and we'll get to that later. Lack of protection can happen in all kinds of ways, but what it might feel like as an adult, um, is that, that, that we have an adult body, but deep inside there's this chronic low-grade anxiety that as we get a little bit older can show up as panic attacks, sleep disturbances, a, a sense of being younger than we really are. So I just wanna talk a minute about how this might set in really young. We've talked about how women can transmit anxiety to their little children through mirroring and facial gestures and things of that nature, our breathing patterns, but also, Studies are showing us that children under the age of three who are in daycare have a higher level of cortisol in their saliva. Cortisol, which you probably know is the stress hormone that gets activated when we're in danger and we need to run or we need to fight, um, which obviously 
is really hard to do if you're six weeks old in a crib. Um, so cortisol is toxic for brain development. It's toxic to the hippocampus, the memory center in the brain. And so um, infants in daycare, toddlers in daycare that don't yet have language even can be having brain changes based on high levels of cortisol that are being released because they are in situations which translate to infants, I'm not safe, um, which can happen when there are many caregivers, lots of loud noises, um, and when a baby's removed from the familiarity of either their mother or a constant primary caregiver. The definition of primary caregiver is someone consistent for eight hours a day. Just a note here that little ones really aren't in daycare for socialization when they're under the age of three, because socialization and peer involvement gets going more when the brain hits about three years of age. Okay, if you don't know this resource, I want you to have this resource. If we had time right now, I would do a breathing exercise with you because if you've made it this far into the discussion, you might be feeling some anxiety. That would be really normal. Um, yoga with Adrian is one of my favorite um, sites for my own yoga practice, but she does this beautiful left, right nostril breathing activity. It takes about three minutes and your nervous system eventually calms down. I do this with my clients. I do this with myself. I would do this with you right now if we were gonna be together for more time. Um, but anyway, yoga with Adrian, highly recommend. Okay, so guidance. This is the third element of um, maternal care. Usually kicks in a little bit later and there is a risk that if a mother um, hasn't been able to adequately nurture you, she hasn't been there enough to protect you, chances are you're not gonna trust her guidance when it becomes time. This is where a lot of mothers and daughters have conflict that um, starts later in life. And it's like, where did my sweet little girl go? Well, when the little girl starts growing up and realizing she's raised herself already, it's really hard for her to listen to her mother's guidance. These girls become adults too soon. They're longing for inspiration, someone to admire. They're very vulnerable to somebody misusing power against them or misusing power themselves because they have become adult too soon. My favorite book as an example of poor maternal guidance um, is Wild Game. This is a fantastic memoir. Um, if you like a memoir, it's an easy read. Um, but Adrienne talks about her own story of being 14 years old and experiencing her first kiss at the beach one summer. And it's this delightful kind of short replay of what that what, what it felt like, how yummy it was. And then she gets ready to go to bed that night and her mother comes in. And her mother begins to share the details of kissing her father's best friend and essentially beginning an affair with um, a family friend and then continues to share this with her daughter for years, years. And what it's like for Adrian to be chosen by her mother and how special that feels. I'm my mother's friend now, she's telling me all this and yet to be a co-conspirator against her dad. And what that did to her own sense of agency. And anyway, it's a great example of poor maternal guidance where a mother really abdicates her role as a model, a role model becomes a friend instead of a mother. And this kind of emotional abuse is usually undetected in our culture. In fact, we kind of think it's cute when a mother and daughter are such good friends, which is why the popularity of um, Gilmore Girls is so huge. Um, but I, and I think it's a tricky terrain for mothers and daughters. Um, and this book sheds good light on it. So now we talk about third degree mother hunger for just a few minutes, because I think most any of us who have struggled with addiction um, are gonna understand maybe that it's partly in due to the possibility that there's some third degree mother hunger. Third degree mother hunger is the name I have given what is really complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which is what it's like to grow up in constant stress. There is no post-traumatic stress, it's ongoing. So it's complex post-traumatic stress. Third degree mother hunger um, requires that as little ones, we have to be with our mother yet disappear because she's scary. So we learn very young how to dissociate and we live much of our life in a dissociative trance, which can feel like a fantasy state or just feel like being numb. This kind of living requires an addiction. An addiction is a very resourceful way to deal with the fact that for your entire life, you've been afraid. 
when your source of attachment, your very first love is also a source of fear, this is the worst situation for the brain because the two most powerful neural pathways in our brain are fear to get us out of danger and attachment because we have to attach to grow. When these two neural pathways are activated at the very same time, there is no worse agony for the human being. I call this the original intimate betrayal. If you wanna watch a movie that will illustrate third degree mother hunger, I highly recommend Billie Holiday's story that um, recently is out on Netflix. Judy Garland's story that Renee Zellweger played Judy Garland or Edith Piaf's story where um, we got to see the French singer and, and their, her upbringing. What these three women all have in common were neglectful and uh, abusive mothers. They all had terrible childhood illnesses that followed them into adulthood. They all struggled with um, love addiction, I would call it, you know, having four and five um, intense relationships, having trouble with um, stability and commitment in relationships. They all struggled with drug addiction, primarily heroin. They all died young. Judy and Edith, both being white, they died at 47. Billy died at 44. And I think what we can look at in that story is the added stress of being a woman of color and being hunted by the police. All three also had in common growing up around um, sex workers, which had kind of a mix. It was a mix of there were women around who were nurturing and caring for them other than their mothers. And that was kind of okay. And then as in Billie Holiday's story, her mother at age nine told her at age nine, you need to start earning your keep by doing this. In Edith Piaf's story, um, a prostitute just really took her under her wing and gave her the only taste of mothering she'd ever had. But then her father came and took her away when she was seven, which was just a terrible attachment break. So much more I could say about these three women, but um, it's in the book. Um, the impact of a frightening mother has neurobiological impacts on us, um, psychosocial impacts on us, and health risks, as we see with um, the story of Billie Holiday, the story of Edith Piaf and Judy Garland. Um, Tina Turner's story too, I haven't watched it yet, but I've heard from colleagues who that, that, that that also would fit in this category. Most of you are probably experts on trauma recovery by now. So you don't need me to do a big discussion on how to recover from trauma, how to tend to that pit deep inside of us where all the memories are. Um, that's a whole nother lecture. However, I'm gonna talk just a minute about what gets in the way of healing trauma. Like why, even if you've got the best sponsor or the best recovery group or the best therapist, you might still be running into some roadblocks. Um, oh, and I think some of that's on my, okay. So here are the two main reasons for the road, for the difficulty. One is what I call an apology ache. And this is a term I created for that longing that you might be familiar with, that your mother would somehow on some level recognize the ways that she hurt you in accidentally or on purpose either way and show some remorse. Um, I think it's easy to get stuck waiting for that apology and hoping that as soon as she can recognize it, the pain will go away. But the truth is lots of mothers don't acknowledge their hurtful behavior. They either didn't realize it or even if they do realize that the shame is too hard, or in the case of third degree mother hunger, she is shameless and doesn't feel the shame. In fact, you're probably carrying it for her. So waiting for that apology is really a fantasy. Um, it's a fantasy for closure. It's a fantasy that if that apology comes, it'll all be better. And it's better to just go ahead and kind of work with the grief rather than wait for the apology. And that brings me to the next roadblock, which is disenfranchised grief. I, I think the truth is this is what gets in the way of us grieving what we didn't have so that we can then go ahead and replace it ourselves with appropriate people. When we don't have a name for what's hurting, we don't have a public recognition and without public recognition, we can't grieve. It's why when someone's facing cancer, we have cancer support groups, communities respond with flowers and visits. Um, it, those of you were coming from a, recovering from addiction, hopefully you've had the recognition of peers who have been there before you and could be there with you. You've had sponsors, you've had help, you've had guides. This helps grief move. But if you've not had recognition for mother hunger, the grief can stall and get stuck. 
And this can be so frustrating for those of you that are um, maybe even having really good psychotherapy. If your therapist isn't really aware of some of this, um, it can it can get frozen. In fact, I think frozen grief is the essence of mother hunger. And so my hope for you today is that by listening to this and being open to this concept, if you are struggling with mother hunger, your body will already be feeling relief. The grief will already be starting to thaw and melt and move through your body the way your body knows how to heal. Okay, thank you. I hope that that was succinct enough to give you some information enough that you might have some questions, but not bore you to tears. So um, if you'd like to follow me on Instagram, that'd be great. There's more information there. You can also go to my website where there's a mother hunger quiz, updates about um, you know, my newsletter or whatever. Anyway, there we go, Dawn, I'm ready for, for you. <laughs> oh gosh, now I'm just sitting here thinking, I want the longer version. <laughs> That was really Oh, amazing. well, yeah, Thank I got you. plenty for you. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it'll come up in question. It'll, we'll, we'll bring some more out with questions. That was really, really amazing. You know, I was, um, gosh, you know, mothering and, and mothers and, you know, being a mother of two daughters, these are some of the questions, being a woman in long-term recovery and having one daughter in recovery and having the other daughter now mothering a five-year-old daughter, um, mm. all of these all of these issues, you know, just kind of ah, all the time, having been in therapy for many years over my own relationship with my mom, um, knowing that my own daughters really need probably more therapy than they've had, although Terrence had a lot. <laughs> so thank you. I think, I, you know, I really loved so much of what you said, but I just want to focus on a couple of things. And, and when you talk about naming, naming what it is, um, I think that that is so important to have, as you said, the right name, let's healing begin. The brain loves a name. And in, in our community, you know, she recovers, we talk about how we're all in recovery from something. And then we go through this inexhaustive list of all the things that, that might bring us here. But when we're in community and when we're in discussion and we're in talking, really the, the message that we, that I always try to impart, that Taryn tries to impart, that, you know, our coaches try to impart is, those, those behaviors or those substances or those coping mechanisms, um, they're, they're just kind of the, the tip of the iceberg. And it's always, you know, it's always something deeper, generally trauma in trend, in neglect, you know, being a part of trauma. So I just love that uh, your presentation and I'm so excited for your book really brings us to that point. You know, it's in our community, we kind of sometimes say, what are you recovering from? give women an opportunity to identify along the spectrum of things that they might identify with. Um, and I always just kind of want to say, and, and you know, like what's underneath all of that. And, and, and we don't often know, right. I mean, when I first went into treatment going on 34 years ago, I had a cocaine problem. That was the problem. And I was in an abusive marriage. That was the problem. You know, it had nothing to do with childhood neglect, emotional neglect. Um, it took many years to get to that. So um, what an amazing piece of work that you've been working on and, and can't wait. When is the book out? The book is coming to the world July 20th. Um, and I just kind of want to add something to what you so beautifully said, Dawn, that um, there's something in the book I talk about that's called betrayal blindness, which is kind of a nice way to explain the body's mechanism for protecting us from information we can't know yet. So not only do we not know sometimes the origin of this pain that's beneath our addictive cravings, which I really think addiction is like surrogate mothering. Um, I, I think that our body protects us from knowing because we can't know when we're little that we're really that either in danger or, or not being protected, loved and guided and nurtured. We can't know it. If we knew it as kids, we would just be, you know, so, so bereft. So it takes decades for this information to, to bubble up and find us. And my hope is that a name will help that come a little sooner, but it may not because the truth is our body protects us. Just as you've said, it can take a long time to find the root. Beautiful. I want to share a couple of comments from um, others. So one of our one of our um, attendees in the webinar shares as someone who was parentified as a child this is really resonating with me in fact when thinking about or talking about myself as a child I never think of myself as a little girl but rather a kid if that distinction makes sense 
it makes complete sense. And I think that is parentified children fall into the lack of guidance category because they become their own parent so young and frequently they are also parenting their parent. Exactly. Someone else said that was incredible. It really hit home. Thank you. Um, and so I just, I want to speak for a minute about, so the, the three, I, I don't remember how you kind of package these up, what you call them, but nurture, protect, and guide. Those are the three what? Developmental needs that we all have needs. as children. Yes. Um, I call them the essential elements of maternal care, but they, they are our human developmental needs. And so I have a question for you. Um, so you can, you can have a mother who's very nurturing, but she fails to protect you. You can have a mother who um, is, protects you and nurtures you, but doesn't guide you, like doesn't ever kind of give you information that you need. You can have one, she can, be, she can have, be really good at one and not very good at the other, and the other one can be lacking. Right. I have an interesting question, totally all about myself. But I, I only know through, I really, because I don't have a lot of memories of a very stressful childhood, and I don't have a lot of memories of childhood, but... I, I was, I was able to watch my mom with my daughters and her other granddaughters and know that little kids like she and, and her grandson, she loves little tiny kids up until about maybe eight years, maybe five, six, seven, eight until, and she actually even admitted this one day once you know, she, she died, she died 21 years ago on two tomorrow. But once she admitted, she said, I just love little babies and little kids. But when, as soon as they start getting them, I think she said something like, as soon as they start getting a mouth on them, then I, you know, and, and it was like, so, okay. So I knew that that, but, and then I, that didn't happen with my kids. Like my kids got mouths on them at eight or nine or 10 and she continued to love and nurture and adore them. So it was just, a, it was a part of the, not being in the stress of our younger family life, et cetera. So that was interesting to me, but I think I also get to look back and think, I remember when it happened to me. And so, although I had somebody who nurtured and protected me, she also abandoned me, abandoned that nurturing at a certain point. And there's more to it. And I'll, maybe we'll have a session one day pay to talk this through, but so you can have, you can have nurture protection and guidance for a period of time and then something can happen. And so what is that? How important is it? to have it in your first five years, is it easier when it gets taken away when you're 10 or, you know what I'm asking? I do, I think I do know what you're asking. And I think you're speaking to something that I'm glad you're bringing up that, that, that mother hunger, hunger exists on a spectrum of degree. So if you got a lot of those needs met very young, it means that they were met while your brain was growing the most rapidly. Chances are you got some pretty good security from that. So when adversity comes later, whether it's from your mother or just life, your brain is better able to maybe buffer some of the negative impact of adversity. Whereas when those things didn't happen in the first five years, the brain is already so compromised that adversity later is more adverse, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think what you're speaking to are the degrees in which mother hunger can happen, which is basically the degrees in which we are impacted by adversity. Um, Great. I hope I'm answering that well. I think yes. also yeah. it's really tricky to think about nurturing before there's memory, right? Because so many well-meaning mothers, loving, loving mothers who wanted to really do a great job with the baby still followed sleep experts who said, let the baby cry it out in the crib. I know. And so this mother might have been really nurturing during daylight hours, but those nighttime hours mm -hmm. imprinted into the nervous system, there's no one here for me. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's important to maybe know that your body, our body, all of our bodies hold the memory of what happened, even though we don't cognitively have a memory of it. Absolutely. Um, and just a reminder too, uh, well, we must introduce you to Taryn's yoga. Oh. So yeah, incredible. Yes. Yeah. So um, Taryn actually developed a trauma-informed, uh, she recovers trauma-informed yoga teacher designation. So she, she's now training people who are already yoga teachers to do trauma-informed yoga. Anyway, I'll, I'll introduce you to that off um, later on, but she's, I mean, I'm a little biased. She is my child, but she's uh, the most gifted yoga teacher on the planet. And that's just part of what she's doing in her, in her healing uh, as a healer today. Okay. Lots of questions. I have to stop asking all mine. Like I said, I'll just, well, I'll hire you. We'll have a big session. Okay, Kelly, how do I address the grief and emptiness 
slash hunger I'm feeling as my mother is in early 80s, ill in another state and is neglecting my siblings and I by ignoring our emails and phone calls because she doesn't want to talk about her health. I feel like we are not important to her, but I know it's just because she's scared and stubborn. Abandonment issues surface again and again, and that sucks. That does suck. That sounds like a daily dose of grief. Um, but I wanna address your question about how do I heal this while mom is A, B, and C. I mean, the truth is healing mother hunger can happen, really must happen without interaction with your mother. Um, for many women who heal this, they even wait till mom is not on the planet because on some level, the body knows it's not safe to do it while she's alive. You might feel like you're betraying her somehow if you actually take care of yourself. If you go somewhere else for nurturing, you go somewhere else for safety and guidance. Somehow it feels like you're telling your mother, even if you never say it, that she's not good enough. So I think we run into all of that when we try to start healing this. And so it seems like we ought to be able to heal it with her but I don't find many mothers and daughters that can do this work together. I think this is where maybe Dawn and Taryn are beautiful examples of what it looks like to be in recovery with a mother. But unless you have a mother who's in recovery, who knows about this issue and can, can show some humility, I, I don't think it's really safe to go to her to heal this wound. This is your own work. Oh, that's great. That's great guidance. And, um, for the person that shared that, I'm just, I'm thinking of you because it does, it sounds like it must be very hard. Um, so somebody else, I didn't hear much about third degree mother hunger. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm, I could talk about that for a whole few days. Um, my concern sometimes in talking a lot about third degree mother hunger is I don't know who I'm talking with right now. And it's a very triggering topic. When we talk about mothers who are abusive, um, first of all, we don't wanna know this. As a culture, we don't wanna know that this happens. We don't wanna know it in our own bodies. And if it is our story, we did grow up with an abusive mother. Um, it is so painful to revisit and listen to that I sometimes feel protective of my audience. And I'm feeling that right now. Like, this is how I'm mothering you. I, I wanna give you information, but I wanna do it somewhat gently and somewhat carefully because I'm not there with you if you get triggered. And if, and talking about third degree mother hunger can bring up an emotional tidal wave. So I purposely kept it sh short for today. If you wanna know more about it, you can um, definitely find more information. The book's coming out. You can also see it on my Instagram. If you feel compelled to really dig in with me, sign up for a consultation if you'd like to, but I would feel more safe if I know who I'm talking to about it. And Kelly, thank you so much. We appreciate that. You know, this is a trauma informed space. And so we do, you know, we try to think of the whole. Um, so I don't know if this is the same person that shared this, but um, the question is, what can we do between now and when the book comes out to work on our mother hunger? I fall into the third degree mother hunger category, and I'm wondering what to do between now and July. I'd love to address that. And thank you for bringing that up. I think um, I wanna simplify this a bit. Mother hunger in the third degree form sometimes gets terrible diagnosis like out there in the psychology world of borderline behavior that might be one, bipolar, things of that nature. I, I would ask you to set that aside, but I would say if third degree mother hunger is your legacy, I hope you have, and if you don't have, find an attachment oriented trauma informed clinician to help you. That this is not just general run of the mill psychotherapy. This is a specialized field, and anyone who's trained in attachment EMDR, somatic work, either Peter Levine model or Pat Ogden model, um, family constellation work is also really helpful, or IFS, which is internal family systems, Richard Schwartz's model. If you can find a therapist with one or maybe all of those trainings, you're going to be able to start addressing this third degree wound. You don't have to wait for the book. Um, I will just say though, I mean, a lot of you are probably getting really good help even from your recovery circles and from places like this. Third degree mother hunger is a relational wound. So it does require relational help. It's not the kind of thing you can do by yourself. So the book will help, but it'll also leave a lot of you thinking, oh good, I can fix this if I read the book. Eh, you're still gonna need some love in a human form. 
that's great, Kelly. Thank you. And so um, attachment and trauma informed, let's just, I want to write those down so we can share them again. Good. I really like a, an attachment oriented therapist who is trauma informed. Yeah. Kind of like Taryn with trauma sensitive yoga. You, it's yeah. a different kind of yoga. It's a special. Completely. So you want the same thing from your psychotherapist that it's a specialty. And most people in med school don't get this. And most people in counseling programs don't get this. They have to get it on their own. So you want to look for somebody who's explored the extra training in trauma. Yeah. And you also said um, someone maybe um, skilled or trained in family constellation or work or internal family systems. Yes. Yes. Great. And we've actually had um, one of our, she recovers coaches. She's not a therapist. She's a physician, but she did a presentation on internal family systems for a mental health Monday for us one day. So we have that. And we actually have another can't remember one of our other coaches um, is trained in family constellation work and she, oh, Tammy Roth. Do you know Tammy in Nashville? I don't know Tammy. Oh, oh she's, she's involved with a lot. She's a therapist and coach in, in Nashville. And she's going to come back and talk to us about family constellation work. So. Oh, it's um, so dynamic. I use it in intensives and it literally in 30 seconds, the whole story of, a, of how you feel about your mother comes out of the body. Incredible. Crazy. So speaking of intensives, um, somebody says, this talk blew me away. There was so much wisdom you generously offered us. I will share this video with many. How do your intensives work? Mm -hmm. they, um, they're they not working very well right now. <laughs> you know, I mean, we've had a global pandemic, which I've had to suspend them. Um, and, and But they're a one-on-one -on -one experience that is uniquely designed to, to work with this injury and can be anywhere from 10 to 15 hours. Um, and right now I have a waiting list. So I'm not, I don't, I don't, I'm not offering them for a while because then I had to put everything on hold. They're not working great right now. So I'm um, trying to do a lot of things like this and get back online with intensives, hopefully sometime in 2022. Mm, wonderful. Um, another question. I lost my mom as a preteen. I'm very sorry. And my dad is not nurturing at all. How much does the father's role impact the severity of mother hunger? What a beautiful question. Um, even in the question, I think there's the answer. I mean, the father or any other caregiver, let's say, that is partnered with the mother um, can significantly mediate the impact of mother hunger in a good way or, or make it worse. Um, I'm sorry for the loss of your mother. You were at that very tender age that Hope Edelman writes for. That's what. That's why she wrote the book Motherless Daughters. You might also like the work of um, Claire Bidwell Smith. Claire with Bidwell Smith is a grief expert. She lost both her parents before the age of 18. She partners with Hope Edelman, and in the past. They have done motherless daughter retreats, and I think you would probably want to look into those retreats and maybe consider one. Incredible. Um, somebody else is sharing, I truly feel my children are going to benefit from this today. Thank you. Oh, nice. So Thank you so much. Um, so there are a few people on Facebook who are saying that they do feel very anxious, and they're asking for tools for self-regulation if you feel called to share one. Okay, well, well, let's do the, the left, right nostril breathing. We have a few seconds we can do this. Yeah. This is an immediate relief for the anxiety. Um, and thank you for the question. That shows such good self-care because I think what's what our body wants to do when we're anxious is just dissociate and act like it's not happening, but this is happening. So, um, okay. I think I probably won't do the fingers exactly right, but it doesn't really matter. You want one kind of in the middle of your nose and then one on the one nostril and one on the other, okay? So in the middle, what you're gonna do is, let's just start, this is my left nostril, and I'm gonna hold it closed and breathe in four times on the right side. And then I'm gonna hold my breath there for four count. One, two, three, four. Then I'm gonna cover that nostril and breathe out four on the alternative, down four. One, two, three, four. Then I'm gonna breathe in on that same nostril four. Mm -hmm. Hold, and then alternatively de um, exhale on the other. Let's do it one more time. In, hold, and out. 
in, hold, and out. Okay, clearly you can see why I'm not a yoga teacher, but anyone can do that breathing exercise. I've done that even when I'm like stuck in traffic. Um, it's just an immediately, it down regulates the nervous system. So I hope just continue doing it for a few seconds as you're feeling anxious. Thank you. It's beautiful. And, and Taryn does that one all the time as well. So it's a real, it is a really good one. More questions. Um, can you, so another, uh, you've explained this already, but so maybe can you speak more to um, third degree mother hunger as it relates to disorganized attachment? Well, I, I can just kind of talk about the fact that I find it's very helpful to understand that disorganized attachment, um, which means that it's really hard to know how to trust anyone. Do you go toward what feels good? And if you go toward what feels good, that's going to be scary because then you're just waiting for the next shoe to drop. It's, it's a very confusing way to live in the body. The body's always really confused about relationships in general. And because dissociation uh, is so woven in to the attachment style, it takes a while to even know basic needs, wants, a sense of where you begin and somebody else begins. Um, I think what I've heard women describe it to me, it's a very amoeba-like existence. And I get frustrated when people say, you know, so-and-so doesn't have any boundaries. Well, when you have disorganized attachment, um, you never really got to form a self. And without a sense of a self, there's, it's impossible to have boundaries. You might have walls, you know, you put up a wall or you have nothing and anybody has access to you, but you really just don't know who you are. And that's normal. That's normal. That's not pathology. This is why I'm trying to reframe it. Great. Thank you. Can mother hunger be present when you had a good relationship with a mother? My mom passed away in my early 20s, but we had a mostly positive relationship. Well, I would think you would miss her. I think losing a mother in your early 20s is devastating. I mean, you're essentially then motherless and orphaned and, and then your own journey as a woman through the life seasons of aging gets lonelier. Um, it feels terrible. So we could call that mother hunger, but it's basically longing for a mother. And that is a normal need. I don't think we ever as women outgrow our desire for a mother. We just don't outgrow it. We always want her to make us soup when we're sick. We want her to celebrate our accomplishments and grieve with us our losses. And so the loss of a mother is a terrible thing. I'm sorry. I am too. Yeah, I'm, I'm sick. I'm going to be 61 in a, couple, in a week or so. And my mom's been gone for 21 years. I was 40. I, on, I think on her funeral, I turned 40. And I still, it's still devastating to me. So I'm so sorry. I can't. And my best friend lost her mom to breast cancer when she was 15, 14, maybe. And I'll just always, you know, would look at her and think, oh, gosh, you know, it's just so unfair. It is. It's unfair. There's, there's a lot of words for it. And I think that one unfair is one of them. So I'm so sorry. I agree, Dawn. It's so unfair. Um, so there was a Facebook question earlier and I, I responded that, uh, that you had explained it wasn't your area of expertise, but I was gonna ask the question anyway. And then somehow the way that I answered it might've taken the question away. But the question was, um, can this apply to fathers too? Father hunger? Yes, it can apply to fathers. Um, that's a different topic. And, and I think a lot of our, um, we've heard about daddy issues so often in, in pop mainstream psychology, we just, you know, that one seems to get a lot of attention, probably because we're talking about men. Um, but father hunger is a real deal. And, and I think for, for we, here's what the science says, is that when a daughter has an attentive, nurturing father who is also a guide, they tend to do better in business. Um, in the external world, they navigate the pressures of patriarchy better. Um, they tend to earn more money. I find this kind of fascinating. So father love tends to, and I'm talking in pretty traditional ways. I mean, there are lots of fathers who are very nurturing. There are two father households where you've got partners raising kids and one is nurturing and one is, you know, so again, I'm, 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 I'm speaking in generalities, but the science says that um, our fathers have a lot to do with how we are externally in the world. 
mothers have how to do we are internally with ourselves and relationships so it's a different thing interesting I, I was looking around there's a book I want to find because I want to ask you about it but first I'm going to say the other question is um somebody took the quiz on your website she answered no to every question and yet um this person really struggles with her relationship and codependency with her mom so what is next for her well, you know, you're bringing up something that I need to address, which is that quiz is really not foolproof. I, 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 um, I did that quiz a couple of years ago. I probably need to redo it. I don't think it's a diagnostic quiz. It's not something that I necessarily use in my office. It's just something that I think that gets the brain thinking about this. Um, but I don't think it's comprehensive. And I think there are lots of people that answer it. And then would the quiz tells you you don't have mother hunger and that does not feel accurate. So that's on me. I need to do something about that quiz. <laughs> There you go. And I can't find the book, but I really want to. Gosh, it's a book that was written about for. It's about uh, not I, I you know what it's about if you are if you do have an addiction problem and it's about um, it's something like fathers of perfect daughters or something it's called. I don't remember what it's about, but it's about perfectionism and and parenthood. Anyway, I'll find it and I'll share it somehow because I think it, it's a good book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me just see what else we have here. We're, it's 10 o'clock here. So it's one o'clock where you are. So we're going to wrap up in just a moment. Let me just make sure I want to make sure that I haven't missed anybody's questions because I do that sometimes. Oh, here's a great one. Oh, and it means so much to so many people who I love very closely, including some members of our She Recovers team. Are adopted children particularly affected by mother hunger? Yes, 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 and yes. Um, and this is in the book and thank you so, so much for bringing this up. Um, I'm not an adoption expert. So I consulted the experts to include in the book and Dr. Marcy Axness is who I quoted quite a bit. She wrote the book, Parenting for Peace, but she's, she studies adoptees to try to solve the riddle of why adults who were adopted seem to have more mental health issues than those who were not. So, she and Dr. Gabor Mate talks a lot about this too. And so I quoted them both. They talk about the implicit embodied rejection that happens when the womb that has carried you is not going to be your primary caregiver. So um, this has implications for surrogacy as well. And children who were uh, have a medical emergency and spend time in the NICU and can't go home with their mother. So separation from the mother at birth and not being able to be held close to her, nursed by her, smell her skin, hear her sounds that you're already in love with at birth will encode possibly a sense of rejection. Now, caring caregivers who know this, study this and can make sure that secure attachment still happens and mother hunger does not have to form, but they're gonna work harder and caregivers that don't know that and treat an adopted baby the same as they would uh, just no, you've got to really be aware of this issue to hopefully help with secure attachment and address the loss. There's a loss. Birth begins with a loss. Wonderful. Is there, who would you recommend? What is the, if you had to recommend one book around secure attachment, what would it be? Um, well, yeah, a, a good, a book around secure attachment, you know, anything that Daniel Brown writes, Dr. Daniel Brown, um, he writes in very academic ways. So I don't know that I'd recommend the book as much as I'd recommend go to his website. It's called The Attachment Project. And on his website, there's so much information right there, just little excerpts on the website about attachment. And then I think he's a guest on many podcasts. You can listen to him. One of the podcasts that talks a lot about attachment that I love is called Therapist Uncensored. These are two therapists out of Austin, Texas, and they deal all with attachment and they've interviewed Dr. Brown. So I don't know that I'd go read. Well, people love the book Attached. It's kind of a mainstream book that deals with attachment. Right. Great. Thank you. I, I decided there's a lot of women in our in our community in recent years who I've heard talk about um, having had perhaps traumatic birth experiences and and, and then have concerns about, um, you know, how that's going to play out for their for their child and for themselves. So. Um, okay, and final comment, and I'm so sorry, and another loss here, somebody who's just got on, so just jumped on our Facebook Live, and she's suffering right now with the loss of her mother. It's been two months, 
since yesterday and I just um, want to say I'm sorry I'll turn it over to you in a moment I'm also we can um, I'd love it for us to share on our Facebook could we share um, maybe in here as well I wrote a blog called when your mother dies and um, it's just about giving yourself permission to just go to bed like well I, I tried I, I try to give kind of advice it's some of it's tongue-in-cheek I, you know, I tell people you can remember deodorant if you think it's important, but it's really not that important to those types of things. And if um, so, maybe if we could share that, we can share that on our Facebook page. Um, not that I'm a therapist, but it's what worked for me. And I've shared that with very a lot of women as after their moms died as reminders that this is this is a time to just take care of you, whatever that looks like. You know, you can tell your children that you can be children other, you know, you can you can kind of go off and do your thing your father or your other partner, your, your, your wife, whoever is in, in charge of the kids, you need to take care of yourself during this time of grief. So two months is very early days. Over to you, Kelly. Two months is the very early days. And I, um, I think right now, because we've all been surviving this pandemic, we're very much in touch with the fact that we're all grieving. And so to add a loss of this nature on top of the losses that you may have been living through in the last year, can become unmanageable pretty quickly. Um, I would just really want to normalize that, that um, there's nothing really that prepares you for this kind of adversity. There's nothing that's prepared any of us, of us for this kind of adversity of chronic long-term um, mental health, uh, physical health problem that's creating mental health problems. And so now let's add this terrible loss and I'm just full of um, compassion. I don't know how old you are or where you live or how you're supported, um, but my hope is that you feel entitled to support. Wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. I, I'm afraid that's it. We've gone a little bit over, but we could stay here forever. Um, thank you so very much for the generosity of your time today and sharing your knowledge and your compassion. Uh, this has really been wonderful. And I hope that we can have you back again. We, we're all looking forward to the book We'll make sure that we share widely about it when it comes out. Um, we've already shared all the links to your websites, et cetera. And I do hope that everybody goes and visits Kelly's website and follow her on Instagram for daily, nearly daily, for regular inspiration. I don't want to commit you to daily if you don't do daily, but it's pretty regular for sure. Um, and for those of you who, um, who don't know too much about She Recovers, we do host these gatherings every Monday morning and every other morning in this time slot. We have um, sharing circles hosted by our She Recovers coaches. On Wednesday, Taryn, Taryn or one of her yoga teachers leads a beautiful trauma-informed yoga practice. It's not on Facebook Live. It's actually in um, on Zoom. And to access our Zoom gatherings, you can go to our website and under online programs, you'll see a link to Together Online and that'll give you our schedule as well as the direct Zoom links. You can, you can uh, attach to the links from there. Every evening at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, we have another sharing circle type gathering hosted by a coach, um, to usually all, often, always topic led. And uh, everyone who identifies as a woman or non-binary individuals who identify with women's communities are welcome to join us there. Um, join us on Facebook where uh, we have a private Facebook group called She Recovers Together. We've shared those links as well. And uh, stay tuned. We've got lots coming up next week. Mental Health Monday will be with Lucy Price, and she'll be talking about rising and recovery through radical self-love. Um, we've got some retreats on our website that are up. I think actually, sorry, Mexico is already sold out. I think we have a She Recovers Support for Healthcare Professionals retreat in Maine that has a couple of spots left. Um, we also have some specialty population groups that meet on Saturdays on Zoom. One is She Recovers Support for Black, Indigenous, and Women of Color, an incredible group that meets, from what I understand, I don't attend, um, but it's a great group. They have a Facebook group. You can also find that on the She Recovers Together online page, as well as the She Recovers Support for Healthcare and Allied Professionals. Uh, in the next several months, as we're able to increase our capacity, we'll be starting one for LGBTQ individuals, one for mood and anxiety disorders, and one for eating disorders. So stay tuned. And if you sign up for our website, our um, newsletter on our website, you will be kept up to date. Thanks again, Kelly. Thank you.